Hey everybody, welcome back. We are nearing the end of our Nationalism and Unification unit. Um, today we're going to head back to Western Europe, specifically to the country of Britain, and talk about some big social and democratic reforms taking place in the country in the 1800s. And, uh, well, let's see what's going on. Um, and we're going to begin by looking at some political and democratic reforms. So if you look at our graph right here on the left, it says uh, before 1832, 95% of people in Britain could not vote. Only 5% could. So that makes Britain sound really undemocratic. And it was from the modern perspective, but it wasn't in the time period that Britain saw itself in the 1800s. That was the time period where in a lot of countries, the uh, you know it wouldn't be 5%, it would be 0% had a right to vote. Nonetheless, Britain has a lot of work to do to expand its democracy. So let's talk about how that's going to happen in the 1800s. So over time, um, laws are going to be passed that's going to gradually, slowly extend suffrage or the right to vote to more and more men. So first we're going to give it to middle class men and then working class men and rural voters and so forth. Um, but you know, it's men only, uh, not women. And as you can see, we've gone from about 5% of people uh, voting to in the ballpark of about, what, 28% uh, or so voting. So now, of course, keep in mind, 50% of the population couldn't vote, period, just be based on gender. So you're looking, if you're thinking of this as just, just the male population, uh, over half of men are voting as we get to the end of 1800s. Now, what are they voting for? Well, one of the things they're voting for uh, would be representatives in a particular organization that meets in this building. Uh, now, this is called the Palace of Westminster, but we know it better as the Parliament Building, right? Parliament. Now, Parliament, the way it's set up is there are two houses, kind of like how we have a, um, a Senate and a House of Representatives. <clears throat> in Britain, they have something called the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And in times past, the House of Lords uh, basically had veto power over the House of Commons. So they were definitely the stronger of the two branches. But that wasn't very democratic because in the House of Commons, you got your seat by being elected by people. In the House of Lords, you got your seat by inheriting it from probably uh, someone in your family. So this was not democratic. This was, and they had veto power over the democratic side. So uh, what's going to happen is over time, the House of Commons is going to slowly and steadily gain more power until they are the dominant branch and the House of Lords becomes subservient to the House of Commons. Now, both, both of these houses are still in existence today, but again, the House of Commons is where the real power lies in Britain. Now, speaking of Parliament, uh, one of the things they were dealing with in the 1800s was the issue of abolitionism. In our, in our last unit, the Industrial Revolution, we mentioned a guy named William Wilberforce, uh, who had been this uh, tireless advocate for the end of slavery, and finally slavery came to an end in 1833 in Britain. So this is another good example of a reform that's making Britain freer and more democratic. All right, we're going to look now at a woman named Queen Victoria. Now, today, of course, Britain still has a queen. It's not Queen Victoria, obviously. It is Queen Elizabeth II. And she happens to be the longest ruling monarch in British history. Uh, she has ruled Britain since the 1950s, if you can imagine that. Uh, she is now in her 90s. Uh, her husband, Prince Philip, is in his late 90s. So, you know, in the future, the monarchy will change hands to Prince Charles, her son, and then one day it'll change to Prince William, his son. Now, the reason I bring this whole thing up about the longest ruling monarch being a woman is the second ruling, second longest ruling monarch in Britain is also a woman. Her name was Queen Victoria. She took over in 1837. Um, and her route to becoming queen was kind of unexpected. A, a series of, of relatives had to die, and, and then it was kind of just almost dropped in her lap. Um, that, so she wasn't really prepared to become queen. It was rather unexpected. But nonetheless, she is. And she's going to rule over really the peak of, of British power. If you think of British 
um, history. This is about as big and as strong and as, as uh, impressive as Britain is ever going to be. And again, she's going to rule from 1837 to her death in 1901. Uh, here she is on her wedding day. She got married just a couple of years into her reign. Um, she married a German prince, Prince Albert, and they went on to have nine children together. Uh, it's one of the great romances in history. They were deeply in love. <clears throat> they also happened to be first cousins. So, yeah, that's kind of weird. There are the two happily married uh, members here, the royal family. Um, and Prince Albert <clears throat> is going to die much earlier than Queen Victoria. In fact, Queen Victoria is going to outlive her husband by about 50 years. She will. Now, as I said, this is the time period where the British Empire is at its peak. Um, everything in purple here was owned by Britain by 1900, which is, you know, the next to last year while uh, that Queen Victoria was in power. And they also had bases all over the place. Uh, in fact, so much of the world was ruled by the British Empire at this time period that people uh, joked that the sun never set on the British flag. Because no matter where you are, it's always daytime somewhere in the world. And the British, the British flag was flying somewhere in the world. <clears throat> because of her long reign and being this is the peak of British power, a lot of things are named for her. Like a whole type of architecture called Victorian architecture is named for her. There's a great desert in Australia named for her. In fact, there's a state in Australia called Victoria. The capital city of British Columbia, one of the provinces of Canada, is named for her. This huge harbor in Hong Kong is named for her. The biggest lake in Africa and the third biggest lake on planet Earth, named for her. One of the great waterfalls in the world, also in Africa, is named for Queen Victoria. The highest British military medal, the Victoria Cross, is named for her. The world's biggest water lilies are named for her. Right? And I, I can keep going. I won't. Uh, you get the point. A lot of things are named for Queen Victoria. Now, Victoria is a queen that because of her long reign and because of the power Britain uh, projected during this time period, uh, she is a really important figure in British culture. And she really came to be kind of the embodiment of the values that British people uh, stro uh, strove for. Now, that's not to say every British person uh, believed in these values, but it was kind of seen as the ideal. And these values would include things like uh, a sense of duty, uh, being hardworking, being respectful, being polite, following rules of etiquette, being good with your money. That's what uh, thrifty is, being very morally upstanding. And, you know, having a, having a good family, like the royal family here. Um, so if you're a typical British family, you look up to the, to the royal family uh, as sort of role models, basically. All right, now let's talk a little bit about women's suffrage, because when we started our discussion of Britain and their expanding democracy, we learned that more and more men were getting the right to vote. What about women? Well, being that they're ruled by a woman, uh, I think we can predict pretty uh, fairly that Queen Victoria would be a big fan of women's suffrage. But you'd be wrong. Queen Victoria actually was not a fan of women's suffrage. She called it famously a mad, wicked folly, right? A mistake that women should have the right to vote. Other British women disagreed, including famously a woman named Emmeline Pankhurst. So Emmeline Pankhurst was the, uh, the leader of this thing called the WSPU, the Women's Social and political union. And they began as, as a pretty moderate, kind of run of the mill activist group who made speeches and hand out, handed out leaflets and all that stuff. But they came to the realization that they weren't making any progress, that, that to, to get men's attention, because men are going to have to grant the women the right to vote because only men could serve in the government at the time, that to get their attention, they had to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, and so they turn to aggressively heckling speakers uh, when they're giving a speech. You know, they might throw fruit at them or shout them down or something like that. They turn to smashing windows, to setting things on fire, to sabotaging telegraph lines, even planting explosives. So these women were willing to use violence and aggressive uh, tactics to achieve independence uh, from men. That is to say, suffrage. Now... <laughs> Today, we might call these women something different, not activists, but maybe terrorists, right? Because they're going to be using uh, forms of violence to achieve their goal. 
Now, Emmeline Pankhurst uh, was often in jail. You can see her here uh, in jail, being hauled off to jail. And frankly, that was okay with her because, you know, this is something that's going to get a lot of attention for her cause. You're going to have, you know, newspaper headlines about uh, Mrs. Pankhurst being hauled off to jail and all that stuff. And this is going to, in theory, gain more attention and perhaps sympathy for the cause. Now, some women, while they're in custody, uh, well, some of these women activists, while they're in custody, what they would do is to gain more attention for the cause, they would go on hunger strikes. They would refuse to eat until the government basically kind of caved into their demands. And this led the government to force feed women because the government felt that if women were to be harmed while in their custody, even if it's self-harm, the government would look responsible and they would look bad. And so they felt like, okay, we've got to get these women healthy. We've got to keep them alive. We're going to have to force them to eat. And then, of course, that actually makes the situation worse because images like this are frankly kind of horrific. I mean, think about this not as just a random woman, but what if that's your mother or your cousin or your sister um, that had been protesting and now they're being manhandled and like a tube shoved down their nose to force them to eat? Um, all just because they want the right to vote. A good example of women's dedication to this suffrage movement would be the story of Emily Davison. So Emily Davison had this idea that she would go... Um, to the English Derby, this big horse race, and there, uh, the the English uh, at the English Derby, the king's horse was going to be racing, and she felt if she went out there and disrupted the race, uh, she would gain attention for the cause of women's suffrage. So that's what she tried to do. She ran out on the horse race as it was going on, and she was struck by one of the horse or the race horses, and killed. Okay, there, there's the horse. There's Emily Davis, and there's her hat flying, and there's the jockey. Um, and again, she was killed. She she basically sacrificed herself for the cause of women's suffrage. This is, I think, a really interesting piece of, of um, propaganda to encourage people to give women the right to vote. And the message is that, you know, women, what a woman may be and yet not have the vote right? Women can be all these positive things and never get the right to vote. What a man may have been and yet not lose the vote. So a man can be, you know, some negative things and still not lose his vote. And they're trying to show that, you know, gender doesn't give you some sort of um, natural right to rule over the other uh, half of the population, that women should have the right to vote just as much as men should have the right to vote. And by 1918, finally, women do gain the right to vote, at least if they're over the age of 30. So still not totally equal with men, but certainly making strides. All right, our last topic we're going to briefly talk about is next door to Britain, and that would be the island of Ireland, the Emerald Isle, they call it. Now, Ireland, at the time, all of it was under the control of the British. So think of Great Britain being kind of like right here off the map. You can see just a little bit of it right here. They controlled Ireland as well. And this is going to lead to some problems because a lot of Irish, out of feelings of nationalism, didn't want to be ruled by their next door neighbor, the English. They didn't like being um, kind of lorded over in their own country. And this had been going on for centuries. I mean, the British came in back in the 1600s and conquered much of Ireland. And then in the 1840s, disaster strikes. Uh, the famous, infamous potato famine that destroys the potato crop and leaves about a million Irish dead, whether that's from starvation or malnutrition or a combination thereof. Millions more Irish are going to flee the island, uh, desiring to get somewhere where they can have more rights and more economic uh, opportunities. Many of those came to America, of course. And you can see the map, just areas where the population dropped, uh, you know, over 30% of the population. That's basically one out of every three people either died or left these areas in the dark red. Here's a, uh, a monument to those, those Irish people who are leaving Ireland and suffering during the potato famine uh, in Dublin. Now, interestingly enough, the population of Ireland today is still less than it was before the famine. So you can see the population of, of Ireland had been a, a little over 9 million, and then the potato famine struck, and it dropped 
to about 4 million. So literally half the population either died or left, and they've only recovered up to a little over 5 million in the modern day. All right, guys, that is it for our discussion of British reforms. In our next video, we're going to finish up the unit uh, on nationalism and unification.